start by telling you a story, and maybe you, you remember this story. It takes place in 2010. August 5th of 2010, there was a mine in the country of Chile that suffered a massive explosion that caused a cave-in, and miners were trapped below the surface, and they were looking for a way out. They were looking for any access they could find, and when it became evident that there was no way of escape, these 33 men were trapped 2,500 feet below the surface in this uh, stone tomb. All water, all electricity, communication was all cut off by the cave-in. And when it was clear that there'd be no way they could dig their way out, some of the older miners had this overwhelming sense of finality. And tears began to flow as they accepted that they would never see their families again. One of the experienced shift supervisors knew that after six or seven days, the rescuers, if they don't find you, they'll give up. They had enough food for their daily meal consisted of one teaspoon of fish and two cookies. So less than 300 calories per man per day. They had no idea how long they'd be underground and with such a limited food supply and 33 men, their survival was in doubt. One of the miners was a Christian and he led all of the miners in, in a prayer for rescue. And not long after that, some of the men began to hear distant drilling and they said, hey, they're, they're, they're coming for us. They were all excited. Oh, it's a lie, one of them said. You can't hear anything. And sure enough, it was just their imagination. Seven to eight hours after they had been trapped, they, again, they began to hear again this, this sound of grinding and, and drilling, this hammering. And this time, they were right. Unknown to them, there was a flurry of activity on the surface. There were men drilling. They were drilling nine different holes in hope that one of them would get to the right spot. But the days passed. Pessimism grew on the surface. In fact, some said the miners are all dead. On day 12, one of the miners was writing in his diary. He wrote this. He said, hardly anyone talks anymore. The skin hugs on the bone of our faces. Our ribs are beginning to show. And when we walk, our legs tremble. They were slowly starving to death. Day 16, they ate their last peach. That was it. The food was all gone. Some of the men started writing farewell letters to their families. Some of the men were so weak, they were scared to fall asleep because they didn't think they'd wake up again. But one man kept insisting, they're coming for us. They're coming for us. Day 17, the drilling was getting louder and louder, and suddenly there was an explosion, and two men rushed toward the noise, and here they found there was a length of pipe protruding from the rock. So one of the miners grabbed a wrench, and he started hammering on this pipe. We're here, we're here. The miners were excited, they embraced, and they were crying. Finally, 17 days, they'd finally been found. On the surface, the drill operator stopped drilling, and he put his ear to this, this steel shaft, and he hears this frantic tapping. It's them! It's them, he called out. They sent down a microphone and a camera in this little hole to confirm the great news. All 33 men were still alive. And within that little hole, they sent down food and water and medicine. It would take another seven weeks for the men to be, to be found. So they took seven weeks, they drilled a, a 28 inch diameter hole that would have to go down for half a mile in order to, be, to fit in this little capsule that was going to be the, the, the rescue vehicle, you could say. And finally, on October 13th, on uh, 69 days after the men became trapped, the last miner was finally lifted to the surface. Against all, against all odds, against starvation and despair, and one man kept insisting, 
They're coming for us. They're coming for us. It's an incredible story of survival and hope. And as amazing as this story is, the Bible gives us an infinitely greater story of hope. So let's pray before we look into that. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the story of hope that we can read today. And Father, even if we've heard it before, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will penetrate our hearts and that we will look with inside. There will be an honest reflection as we look into your word this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Last Sunday, Easter, was uh, a wonderful time of celebrating. I enjoyed celebrating with you the different uh, events that we had, the mor early morning and, and the time at the Hague Gym with the, the community and so on. And I, and I love it that we, we could celebrate, but I, I, think of, I think it just feels too short, doesn't it? I mean, we, we, I think of Christmas. We have the four Sundays of Advent and the, this big build-up to Christmas. And for Easter, eh, we don't really have that. So I'm not quite ready to leave the resurrection story just yet. Thank you, uh, Dave and Jane, for reading that passage in Luke 24. Turn there. If you haven't already, turn to Luke 24. That's going to be our secondary passage, actually, but uh, turn there anyway. And I want to draw our attention to something that might seem a bit less obvious in this story. A couple of lesser-known disciples are traveling from Jerusalem to a little town called Emmaus. It's Sunday evening. Jesus rose from the dead that morning, so this is Easter evening. And as the couple walk along, suddenly Jesus is walking along with them. They're kept from recognizing him. In verse 17, he asks them, what are you discussing as you walk along? And they stood still their faces downcast. Why? Well, the obvious answer seems to be, well, well Jesus, their, their teacher, their friend, he had been killed. And yes, that's true, but I don't think that is the whole reason why they were sad. So they go on to tell Jesus about Jesus. I mean, they're talking to him, about him, even though they don't recognize him. And they say, well, he was a prophet. And the religious leaders, they had him sentenced to death. And then verse 21, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. See, many Jews thought that the, the Old Testament prophecies that they were reading pointed to a Messiah who was a political and military leader who would rescue the, the Jews from the bondage under the Romans and, and, and usher in this, this kingdom of God. But when Jesus was nailed to the cross, their hope was broken. It was shattered. And what was even more confusing was Jesus' body is nowhere to be found. And, and the women said, the angels told them that he was alive, but the other, some of their disciples went to the tomb and they didn't see him. Then Jesus explains the scriptures to them about himself. And we know how eventually they, they go inside and they're, they're sitting down to eat and then they're allowed to recognize Jesus and then instantly he disappears. And of course they're extremely excited. Jesus is alive. There's, there's a glimmer of hope. They immediately go back to Jerusalem to find the disciples and they, they're explaining to them when they, when they find them. They explain their encounter with Jesus and then suddenly, poof, there's Jesus is right there with them. And he opened their mind to scriptures, and their broken hope was restored. Now, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's, let's connect this next story. 1 Peter chapter 1. You can turn there. So by now, Peter is a leader in the Christian church. And he's writing a letter to Christians who are scattered throughout the Roman provinces, Asia Minor, today we'd call it Turkey, but these, these Christians are scattered in this area, and, and wherever Christians go in the Roman Empire, it seems that they are misunderstood and ridiculed because they refuse to worship the Roman Emperor as a god. They wouldn't worship in the pagan temples. They exposed the immorality 
of, of pagan worship in this pagan culture, and they wouldn't support this Roman ideology of, uh, that, has, that glorifies self and power and, and conquest. This made Christians an easy target for persecution. So Peter writes a letter to them to encourage them. And as we see in, in our Bibles, verses 3 to 12 are, are separated in, in different uh, sentences and punctuation. But in the original Greek, it was all one long sentence. So I'm glad that our English versions have it uh, a little easier to read, maybe easier to understand. So let's start, let's look at our need for hope. Let's start, let's look at verse 3. I'll read it, you can follow along, 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So as I mentioned, Peter is writing to Christians who have suffered deeply. Some of their lives have been shattered. So to encourage them, he gives them hope. And this hope is the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if we think of Peter, when Peter saw the resurrected Jesus, it changed everything. It changed everything. He looked at the future through the lens of the resurrection. It gave him a hope that transformed his life. I like Bible teacher Tim Mackey says it this way. He says, the only language that's appropriate about someone whose life has been changed by the resurrection is that's someone who's been born again. And if you look in your version, you might see the term born again, or maybe like mine, it says new birth. So this, this whole, this is how a metaphor that Peter uses to encourage the reader, and it means that they have a new life from God. And obviously, we're not talking a physical life. We're talking in a spiritual sense. It's this sense of, of freedom from sin, the power of sin. It's, it's also this, this sense that you've been born into a new family, right here, my church family. It's a new nature. It's a new identity. It's, it's a they have been spiritually born into a living hope. Now we could ask, based on what? And it's right the next sentence, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this hope based on the resurrection. God, now we know this, God made humans different than animals in that humans have a deep psychological need for hope. I mean, a cow doesn't wonder if the other cows like her, right? Your, your dog doesn't care, doesn't think about, I wonder where I came from or what happens to me after I die. A fish doesn't want to know what its purpose in life is, right? These are, there's instinct that's built in, but for humans, psychologically, we have psychological needs, and one of those needs is hope. This, this need for hope is explored in a book that I just discovered written by Viktor Frankl. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. I just bought it, started reading it. Viktor Frankl is a Jewish psychiatrist, or was, he's passed away now. He lived in Aus Austria. When he was in his early 20s, the Nazis invaded Austria and, and captured it, so he and his wife were deported. Eventually, they ended up in a concentration camp in Dachau, Germany. He was there for two and a half years. Now, sadly, only himself and his sister survived the horrors of the concentration camp. But in order, he writes, in order to, to find purpose in his captivity, Frankel acted as a therapist right there in the concentration camp. And in the evenings, he would have sessions with his fellow Jewish captors, and he would take notes and he would hide them in his mattress. He was fascinated how people were dealing with the trauma and the horror of a concentration camp. And he noticed something interesting, how life in a concentration camp is, is condensed from what it normally would take place over decades. For example, over time, eventually, you will lose your home, right? You, you'll move into a care home or something like that, so you will lose your home, you'll lose your loved ones. They'll die. Some of them will die. You'll, you'll lose status in your job or, or accomplishments that you once had. As we age, we, we lose 
some of our freedoms to go where we want, when we want. We'll lose our health. So all of these things typically take place over decades, over our lifetime, but he noticed that these losses in a concentration camp took place over about a year, a year and a half. And so he studied how people dealt with those losses, and he noticed something. He noticed that those who didn't survive died less from the lack of food or medicine than from a lack of hope, a lack of something to live for. Some people in the camp became like animals. They were bitter, they were angry, they just acted on instinct and their only goal was to survive. They didn't care about anybody else. Some people in the camp dealt with these losses by just through indifference, ah, oh, whatever, until their bodies gave out. Some people in the camp survived psychologically by, by fantasizing. Everything's a fantasy. Oh, yeah, everything's going to be okay. Eventually we'll get out and we'll go home and we'll go to our, our loved ones and our jobs and everything will be just as it was before. And it actually helped them to survive throughout their whole ordeal in the concentration camp, but Frankel followed them, or at least some of them, he followed them after and he found that they would crash and burn when they got out, figuratively speaking. They'd crash and burn because none of those things actually happened. Things weren't the same as when they left. And then he writes that there was a small group of people like himself who were, you know, semi-healthy, you could say, reasonably. They survived, and it was because they hoped, or they had hope that transcended their circumstances. They survived because they had a hope that transcended their circumstances. So, Frankel, for example, he had a hope that someday he would be able to help other people by uh, restarting his practice of psychiatry. Yeah, a real hope that no one could take away from him. So getting back to our passage here, Peter, he write, he's writing to suffering Christians in Asia Minor, as we read, and he points them to hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's go to the next thing I want to look at is living hope gives us a vision for the future. And we see that in verse 5. So look at what it says. It says, God has given us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Now, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So it, it's like the imagery of a, you could say, a bank. You have money and you have it in this bank. But, but this is a bank that's not affected by poor interest rates. It's not affected by a bank that closes its doors. I mean, this, this is wealth, you could say, that will never spoil or, or fade or disappear. And it says this bank is in heaven. And the point being that this wealth, or inheritance as Peter calls it, it's, it's under God's protection. It's secure. Now, what is that inheritance? It's being kept for the future. And we read that it is salvation we receive when Jesus returns. And I think that's pointed out at the end of verse 5. It's salvation we receive when Jesus returns. So knowing that we have this, this beautiful hope of this inheritance, it helps us to endure loss and tragedy in our lives now. Our lives don't come apart when we face hardships because we know that there's a wonderful inheritance that is to come. I don't know about you, but have you ever, have you ever been in the midst of something painful and you've thought, oh, I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait till that time when we're in heaven and I can leave all this pain and this frustration behind. You ever thought that? I have many times. And I think the older you get, the more life experience you have, this thought will come to your mind more and more. And by the way, this inheritance of eternal life, this, this, is, this is not just automatic for every person. It begins the moment you put your faith in Jesus. I mean, this, this is amazing, and he even says that in verse 6. 
He says, in all this, you greatly rejoice. In all this, in all what? Well, he's talking about living hope. That one benefits us now because it helps us endure hardships. And this living hope benefits us in the future. I just mentioned that it's inheritance of eternal life when Jesus returns. And Peter says, this is reason to rejoice. Do you agree? This is where you'd say amen. Okay, there we go. This living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a transforming hope. It has the ability to see your hardships, your heartaches, your suffering, your pain as having some greater purpose. And that's my next point. Hope sees suffering as having a greater purpose. And we can go to verse 7 and we see here how Peter is pointing out the purpose of their suffering. Let's read that. Let's actually backtrack a little bit. Let's start at verse 6. Read verse 6 and 7. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Let's go back to that book that I was talking about. Frankel quotes Friedrich Nietzsche, who is a German philosopher, who said this, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Let me read that again. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Meaning, when we see the purpose of our suffering, one can withstand much suffering. Let's think of Jesus. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the most intense nights of grief and suffering he endured while he was on this earth. And remember, he prayed. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Now, we know that biblical prophets use this, this word cup as a symbol for suffering. So he's saying, take away this suffering that I'm supposed to endure. He, he was just expressing his true feelings of, of dread at what was about to happen. And we know that to be crucified and to bear the sin punishment of all people. Jesus knew the why of what he was about to suffer. And he knew that his suffering would change the human condition, making us acceptable to God the Father. That was the purpose for his suffering. That was the why of his suffering. And knowing that, he was willing to accept the how which was, must have been terrible. It would have been terrible. Now going back to 1 Peter chapter 1, he writes, the reason, the why, for their suffering, the how, is to prove that their faith is genuine. So another way of saying it would be to say the genuineness of one's faith is proven through suffering. And that, according to the end of verse 7, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When our faith withstands the test of suffering, we bring glory to God. Why might one's faith not withstand the test of suffering? Let's look at that under Suffering Exposes False Hope. And back to that book, Man's Search for Meaning, the people who tried to survive concentration camp through fantasy, they were envisioning their life, you know, later, they would be, their experiences, they would all come back to them, they would be brought, you know, back to all the joy that they had before the Holocaust. They put all of their hope in something that wasn't real, and when they were free, they realized so much had changed. It was a false hope. It was a false hope. In verse 7, Peter refers to a refining process and he talks about gold so gold is heated to a high temperature and that that separates the ore of the gold from from you could say the impurities of the gold so that you can just remove the impurities God may allow suffering or hardship or frustration or pain in your life in order to remove the impurities to strip away all that gives us 
false hope. And that can be people. Other people. It can be status. It can be money or a job or a business or your looks or your reputation or popularity. It can be whatever you excel at. I mean, you fill in the blank. We may think these are our key to surviving, but sooner or later, they'll all be taken from us and they will be exposed as false hope. One Bible teacher put it this way. He said, in our Christian worldview, I am able to receive people or, or money, job, business, the things that give me joy in life in a way that is open-handed. It was a gift. Hope can help me see my losses as a gift that is stripping away my false hopes. Now, it took me a while to wrap my head around that. Let me read it again. Hope can help me see my losses as a gift that is stripping away my false hopes. Christ's resurrection means that there is someone who loves us so much that I can have an open hand to all, all the things that I enjoy in my life and not put my hope in them because I know that they won't last. My hope does not come from within. It, it's not something that I've done. My hope comes from something outside of me, something that was done for me from the resurrected Christ. So let me, let me close with this, <clears throat> ask you a question. What are you really hoping in? Are you relying on false hope? And if you're not sure, here's one way to find out. When it's threatened, you will fall into distress. You'll fall apart. You'll be filled with anxiety. You'll, you'll, you'll be stressed. You'll struggle to cope. And then you'll know you were relying on false hope. Back to the two disciples in Luke 24, traveling to Emmaus. They put their hope in a political and military savior. And when that hope was nailed to a cross, it shook their world to the core. But when they realized Jesus was alive, their broken hope was restored. Do you need that kind of hope? Or do you need to be the person to talk to someone who needs that kind of hope? Put your hope in that which is eternal, that which is not touched by life's circumstances. So let me leave that challenge with you. I'll call up the music team.